it for three weeks already. Um, it is a long chapter and it is a fundamental chapter to understanding um, a lot of what we do in communion but there's a lot more happening here as well which we'll dive into. But let's begin with this um, and maybe you can plot yourself somewhere on this map. There tend to be three kinds of people who come to church. There are those who come in wonder. They have met the Lord Jesus. They come to experience that, that peace that goes above all understanding, that, that, that experience of relationship with God, of being touched by, by God, by Jesus, by His people. There are those who come to church in wonder. Then there are those who come to church wondering. They come seeking. They come looking maybe for that presence, that feeling, that experience, that community. People who will hold me close in my time of need. People who will love me and accept me as unconditionally as Christ promises. So you get those who come in wonder. You get those who come wondering. And then you get those who come wondering what's in it for them. Um, and I hope you're not one of them. Or maybe it's okay if you are. Maybe there's more grace than we think. Jesus is busy with the people here. He's busy. He's busy with them. He's teaching. Well, he begins, doesn't he, with the feeding of the 5,000. And the people love him for it. They love him so much they want to make him king. Because he can make food out of nothing. He can feed us even if we are hungry and have nothing of our own. This is who they want for king. Jesus does the opposite. Instead of going with them, he disappears into the mountains. We, 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 we've been in that part of the story. Then there's a little miracle of walking on the water and he ends up on the other side of the lake in Capernaum. And the people love him so much and what he can do for them i.e. make bread out of nothing. And boy, if you can make bread out of nothing, what can't you do? What else can you do for me? What other miracles can you perform in my life? And so they go looking for him. They walk around the Sea of Galilee to find him in Capernaum. They come to him. I'll read from last week and say, Lord, how did you come to be here? Where have you been? We've been looking everywhere for you. And Jesus tells them then what I'm telling you now. He says, you did not come looking for me because of who I am. You came looking for me because of what I can do for you. You came looking, wondering, what else is in it for you? And then he begins talking with them about him not being just a regular prophet, not a regular king, something different, someone different. And they kind of get it, don't they? They say to him in last week's passage, they say, Lord, we know that Moses Pray to the Lord in the desert, in the book of Exodus. And the Lord sent manna from heaven on which our ancestors fed every day. And that sustained them. And they kind of have a dig at Jesus. They say, surely, surely you're not greater than Moses, our great prophet, our great ancestor. And Jesus says, you don't get it. Manna, manna that appears every morning in the desert. It only lasts a day. And you know what? The people who ate that manna, they died human deaths. They did not live forever. Manna, as miraculous as it was, is not what I am. And then verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then we skip a chapter, a, a, a little piece, and then the Jews began to complain. Now, interesting, that word for complain here is the same word that the Israelites use in the desert when they have no food. Remember last week, the, the Israelites are hungry in the desert, and what do they do? They complain to Moses, and they say, Oh, we'd rather go back to Egypt and be slaves, but be well fed, than live in the desert. And here again, the Israelites begin to complain. 
and to grumble against Jesus. Their complaint is that they say, hang on, isn't this Jesus the son of Joseph? We know him. We know which football team his dad supports. We know who his mum votes for. He can't be. It cannot be true that he can say, I have come down from heaven. It simply isn't possible because we know where you were born and how you have lived. Funny turn of events, isn't it? From wanting to make him king when he was offering free bread to now questioning when he says, I have more to show you. I have more to give you than just bread. I am the bread. But you see, the Israelites, quite like ourselves, are stuck in that mentality of instead of wondering at the presence of Jesus, they are wondering what he can do for them. So Jesus says, don't complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. The image there, the word there in fact, is that of being drawn in a net to the side of the boat. So Jesus says, unless you are caught in the net of faith, unless God has drawn his net of grace and of love and of compassion and of everlasting life around you and pulled you to the side of the boat, then you cannot come to Christ. Now a lot of people read that and they get pretty down. They think, well, if that's the case, then I'm done for. But I think we need to be a little bit more positive about, about what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that it's not up to you. It's up to God. And what do we know about God? That His love and His mercy is the same for all people and it is the same for all time. God continually draws us to himself. God continually catches us in his net. We simply come to that realization at different stages. Now we can make a sermon about that, but not today. Verse uh, 47, 48, then we'll go ahead. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. And they died. It didn't last. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now we celebrated communion last week and we spoke, um, we spoke about how important this bread of life concept is when taking communion together. So because we've done that we can now shift our focus away from the moment of coming to the table of grace and talk about what it means to now go from the table and to live your life in the world outside of this chapel. You heard Connie speak about the need of all Christians to take seriously the call to speak of the gospel, to tell of Christ so that others may hear it. You know it in your own context, in your neighborhood, in your street, in your family, in your place of work, whatever the case may be. How do we go to people, and I want to say this as sensitively as possible, who might believe that religion is only a means to an end, who might be convinced that this God thing is only about wondering what's in it for me, how much I can get out of it, what God can do for me. And how can we help them to see that our faith is not about what God can do for you. It is about who Christ is. Think about, um, think about significant relationships in your own life. Maybe a romantic relationship or a friend, even someone at work. When you first meet someone, there's that, um, that unconscious uh, uh, stock taking that takes place, isn't there? You're kind of evaluating, even if it's subconsciously, does this person's values align with my own? Does aligning with this person 
leave me in a better off or a worse off position than I was. In, in, in essence, and there's nothing wrong with this, we do this uh, uh, quite, quite uh, involuntarily, we are asking ourselves when we meet someone the whole time, what's in it for me? What can I gain? Or at the very least, what do I not lose by associating with this person? And in the beginning stages of a relationship, it's very much like that. It's give and take. Um, you pay for one coffee, I pay for the next. I pay for a movie ticket, you pay for a movie ticket, etc., etc. But what happens in good relationships, in healthy relationships? After a while, you begin to long for that person's presence not for what they can do for you, but simply for who they are. It's one of the big um, learnings and, and I suppose maturations in relationship and indeed in faith itself is that we don't love people for who they'll be 10 years down the road because that's not love. We love them for who they are now. Now you need to remember that in faith as well. God does not love you for who you will be 10 years down the road or 5 years down the road or tomorrow or when you clean up your life. God loves you as you are now. But you see, we have this other voice in our heads. The voice of the, um, of the accuser, the voice of the tempter. Think back to that story in Genesis of the snake. What is he doing with Eve and Adam? What game is he playing? What does he say to Eve? He says, did God really say that you can't eat of any of the fruit? And Eve corrects him and says, no, no, God said we can eat of all the trees, but not of this specific tree, because if we do, we'll die. What does the snake do? He says, are you sure? What if you don't die? What if there's more in it for you than you think? And you see that little voice of what's in it for me? What can Christ do for me? What can faith and church and Christianity do for me? is one of the most insidious and dangerous and at the same time subtle little voices we must learn to deal with in faith. Because if you are asking that question, then you are committing what St. Augustine called the original sin, which is always turning everything in towards yourself, always making everything about yourself, always seeking first your own gain, before the gain and the well-being of others. Now, as it was in the time of Jesus, so it is today. The people Jesus is talking to are born into that worldview where they think that a relationship with God is only as good as what you can get out of it. And you may be in that place as well, and you might know people who are in that place as well. It speaks to a certain worldview which certain people hold. And I suppose you could make the argument that we all hold this to some, to, to some degree. But if you believe that the world is black and white, that there's good and there's evil, and that everything is a struggle, then you begin to see your relationship with God as, um, well, what's a good way of explaining this in, in terms of the Olympics, as, a, um, as an unfair advantage over your competitors of your opponents on getting a leg up and on doing better and on defeating the evil in life by aligning yourself with the good. And there's nothing wrong with that, that's fine. But you remain in that mindset of, it's not really about Christ, it's about what Christ can do for me. For the people in this story, it's not really about Jesus saying, I'm the bread of life. It's about, but instead of being the bread of life, why don't you give us bread? That's, that's more valuable. That can really, you know, change our lives, get us through the next day. But Jesus, you see, is uh, playing a different game, if you will. Jesus is not playing the game 
of the world is good or evil, and you've got to come out on the winning side. Jesus is playing the game that says it doesn't matter what rules you play by, you have to play it with me. It doesn't matter what you believe about your life or what journey you are on in your life. I have to be a part of it. I have to be so much a part of it as the bread that you eat becomes a part of your body. That is the only way to gain eternal life. There's no game that you can win. There's no rule set you can play. There's no drug you can take to, 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 to cheat your way out of it. There's no ref you can bribe. If you want to gain eternal life, you can only do it in relationship with me. You must ask yourself, you, are, you must stop asking yourself what I can do for you, and you must start asking yourself who I am. And perhaps, and we'll end there, perhaps that is one of the most valuable, valuable ways for you to take home and to read the Bible and to think about faith, to think about the faith of others, because as I've mentioned before, there's a lot of, there's a lot of harmful theology in the world. There are theologies and doctrines that uh, quite, quite blatantly, quite flag flagrantly will try to push this idea that, that, that God is only as as useful as the things that we ask for. That God is only useful in making you healthy and wealthy and wise. But you must remember, you have to remember, those 12 disciples, well, 11 disciples, who sat with the Lord when He broke bread, when He passed the cup, at the first Eucharist, who ate of his body and drank of his blood and then saw him broken and bleeding on the cross, you must remember that none of them ended up happy or healthy or wealthy or wise. They died by all accounts, terrible, terrible, terrible deaths, every one of them, exiled and tortured and killed in ways that are too cruel to mention in church. Why would we take the gospel for which they were willing to die, for which they were willing to die those deaths, why would we take that and then turn it into a game we play like we play the stock market, asking, what's in it for me? How much good can I extract for myself from this thing called church, or the Bible, or God Himself? Why would we not instead approach faith the way you approach a healthy, mature relationship with someone you love? And say, I'm, and ask yourself, am I past that point of associating with this person because there's something in it for me, because my life is, is better as a result thereof? And would you not rather start asking yourself, instead of what's in it for me, who is this? Who can this be? And look, if you're doing that, remember you're in good company. Every time Jesus does something in the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of John, the people end up asking, who is this? Who then is this? Who can this be? Well, then there's this. Remember that question they asked the first morning they wake up in the desert and that white powdery substance is covering the ground? What's the word we said last week? Manhu. Manhu is, uh, is old Hebrew for what is it? What is this? And Manhu became, in, our line, in, in the way we pronounce it, manna. Now, how about this? In your relationship with Christ, when you pray, when you read your Bible, instead of asking, what's in it for you? Ask of Christ, Manu, 
What are you? Who are you? How are you? What are you doing in this moment? What are you saying? And try to forget about yourself completely and discover instead that bread of life which is eternal. Because here's the thing. <laughs> Whatever it is you can ask for in this world, regardless of why you come to faith or come to church or call yourself Christian, regardless of what it is you can ask for, in some way, shape or form, it will pass. In some way, shape or form, it will leave you like the ancestors in the desert who ate the manna and died. And when you stop asking for what you can gain and start asking after the one who gives, then you discover eternal life, everlasting life, life that cannot be diminished or snuffed out by any power in this world or the next. We'll end there. We will um, we'll pray. We'll get our worship team back up to the front. And then after our prayer, we will sing um, a very fitting song, Living Lord. And I ask that we sing that as part of our final prayer as well. And then after that, our benediction. And then we go out into the glorious sunshine and enjoy our fellowship together and our morning tea. Let's bow our heads and pray. You who are the bread of life, you sustain us. You who are the living water, you quench our thirst. You who are the light of the world, you keep us from stumbling. Today and every day until your kingdom come. You call us, Lord, to learn from you what true and profound and genuine relationship there is between you who are the creator of all things and us, your creatures, those created in your image here on earth. Our Lord, we acknowledge that we get it wrong. That the same voice that tempted Eve and Adam also tempts us to always seek our own gain, to always want to turn things in towards ourselves. But we acknowledge also, Lord, that in your crucifixion, your resurrection and your ascension, our eternal life has been secured. You have drawn us to the side of the boat in your great net of mercy and love and grace. And we stand ready to learn not what you can do for us, but simply who you are. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, to you all the glory. Amen.